For those who are unfamiliar, this is Greg Locke on screen. He's a hate preacher, televangelist, megachurch pastor, uh, hates the gay community. He hates the Illuminati more than anybody. Um, that's like his big thing. He talks about the Illuminati coming to get him constantly. Well, anyway, he's been in a conflict with his neighbors recently over noise complaints. Now, technically, the area that he's in doesn't have any like noise rules or noise like regulations or whatever so he can be as loud as he wants technically but he claims to be in a lawsuit with his neighbors basically trying to get his church to move so he came out and announced the other day that he's going to get a soundproof tent he's spending six hundred thousand dollars on a soundproof tent if there's one thing i've learned about this guy it is that he doesn't do anything for his neighbors, or, or out of the kindness of his own heart. He doesn't do it. It just doesn't happen. This is part two. If you haven't seen the other, don't sweat it. This stands independently of the rest. I'll provide context if it's missing. But I wanted to listen to what he had to say after announcing that he had this soundproof tent that he's going to put up. Um, I think the tent goes up in the next like couple of weeks or something. So yeah, let's give it a listen. See what he has to say for himself. And while we listen to Greg Locke, spread nutter buttery all over everything we're going to play some super metroid i am almost done with the game i have one boss left mother brain but i'm tr going around trying to find some like extra missile packs i'm missing three missile packs two super missile packs and two power bombs um i don't remember where they are but anyways yeah we'll find them or we'll just go on to mother brain i'm not sure which we'll see all right, let's give this a listen, see what Locke has to say for himself here. Use the, the front part of their Bible to find a place. Look, I won't, I won't laugh at you if you have to, because we're going to go to the book of Habakkuk, okay? <laughs> it's really in the Bible, and it's not in the back, right? Habakkuk, it's, it's right in the middle of the minor prophets. And so just want you to turn there, it's right after the book of Nahum. And so I want you to turn to the book. Yeah, that was helpful. Thank you so much. Right after the book of Nahum. Oh, I know exactly where it is. That's awesome. He's so good at giving people context, right? My God. Just an expert at helping people find Bible books. Nahum. Why didn't I think of that? It's right after Nahum. And so just want you to turn there. It's right after the book of Nahum. And so I want you to turn to the book of Habakkuk. <laughs> you say, I'm not familiar with these verses. Well, you're about to be tonight. Amen. And we're just going to share them for a little while. The minor prophets, really, major and minor prophets, and they're not called minor, by the way, because they're lesser of importance. They're just minor because they're lesser in context and content. And I'm really sincerely just going to give you a couple of principles tonight out of a few of these verses in the second chapter, Habakkuk chapter 2. Uh, we could dial things back, and I could give you 50 principles tonight and literally do an entire series on this book. And we may very well do that at some point because... I think sometimes we lose the meat and the punch and the theological powerhouse of these books that we never read, that we never pray through, that we never memorize, that we never talk about. And so don't get nervous when I get up and say, go to you know, Habakkuk. You know, some people call it Habakkuk, but it's Habakkuk. <laughs> so, uh, okay, I don't know why he's like so, like, I don't know, jovial and laughy about some book. <laughs> like,. What is happening right now? Why is he making so many jokes? I honestly, if you didn't see part one, I'm pretty convinced that this guy is on meth. I, I'm, I'm very confident. It's just a really weird thing for him. Like this whole, everything about the way that he's talking right now and, and all of it, it's just really weird. We're going to go there and I'm going to go into chapter two and just give you a couple of things tonight just that, that's on my heart. Not even sure why it's on my heart, other than it really dovetails so beautifully and fits with, uh, as I've announced, and as Miss Monica said, just the new things that the Lord is doing in our house. Miss Monica? Okay, now here he's referring to them, uh, like, getting a new big soundproof tent, basically. Here at this church, and so let's just pray, and then we'll move into Habakkuk chapter 2. Father, tonight, I want to thank you for the evidence of your presence Thank you, Lord, for people. Wait, is there evidence at this guy's church? I would love to see it. Lay it on me. All I need is a little evidence, and suddenly you got a believer in me just like that. Getting freedom in various ways and just laying things down at your feet. 
And Lord, forgive us when we lay stuff down and then pick it up and go home with it. Lord, we lay it down because you can bear it and you can carry it and handle it in a much greater capacity than we can. So Lord, stretch our faith tonight that we can see all that you've called us to do. May every man, every woman, every young person, both in-house and online, understand tonight in this message and those that will watch later that you have a burden, a calling, an anointing, a gifting, and a vision for all of us. Everyone in this room is significant for the kingdom. And we all have something that you've called us to do. Someone said it could be Coke, and it could be, but he has a history with meth. That's why I suspected meth. I pray with all of my heart, I beg you tonight to open our hearts and our minds in such a way at Global Vision Bible Church around the world and in this room that we will understand tragedy it will be to go through life being used by everybody but God. God, tonight help us to want to be used by you. Personally, I'm actually okay with being used by your mom. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. And the church said... Habakkuk is one of those minor prophets that is filled with one particular theme, and that is the theme of judgment. I would say that it's probably the undoing of the minor prophets for why which most pastors will never preach, propagate, and teach out of them because they're not happy-go-lucky books. They're easy to understand because of the quickness and the shortness and the duration of the context, but they're hard to stomach and hard to swallow because almost every single minor prophet, at least 99.9% .9 of them, all deal with judgment and repentance. Matter of fact, when you begin the book of Habakkuk, he says in chapter 1 and verse 1, the burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. These visions are called burdens. You know why? Because they were such a burden to proclaim to a buckwild generation and a culture. It was a, a heaviness. There are times that I'll come into church and there'll be a, a heaviness, not, not a depressive heaviness, but a heaviness of the gravity of what I have to speak. I can't imagine what these prophets, many of them were not old men running around in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. We're talking about young whippersnappers that were full of the anointing of God. Whippersnappers, love it. Who were educated on the backside of some desert somewhere in a cave, and God said, this is your vision. This is your anointing. This is your calling. This is your burden. Get up and go tell this nation to repent. And that's exactly what Habakkuk was called to do. Now, this book talks about revival. And I must be honest, as a studier of revival, as a student of revival, I used to quote the book of Habakkuk because he says, O oh Lord, revive thy work. And I would preach on that and everybody would say, Woo, yes, amen, revive thy work. But wait a minute, comma, back up, understand something. The work that he was praying for God to revive was a work of judgment. Okay, I don't understand what he's saying right now at all. I feel like he's just talking nonsense. Is it just me? He does this a lot when he's, you know, doing his whole preaching thing or whatever. He just kind of says words that individually mean something, but when placed next to each other are completely meaningless. They don't belong next to each other at all. It's like, how does anybody stay awake through his sermons at his church? You stay awake through them with me because I make them entertaining. But he's not making this any easier for me. He was asking God to send a revival of judgment. Question, when's the last time we've done that? And I'm not propagating it. I'm not looking for judgment. But judgment must begin at the house of God. Because we say so often, we don't have a White House problem. We have a God's house problem in this nation and around the world. And so the burden that he was to proclaim to these people was, look, the revival of judgment is coming because you will not repent. God will use your enemies against you. And he did that all throughout the Bible, and he does it in the context of this nation right now. If people want evil leadership and they turn from the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, then God will turn them over to their enemies so that they will remember what they had before the enemies took over. And so it's the same. There's always this guy in the background screaming, go, go, go. I don't know what it means or why he does it. It is so deeply confusing to me. 
I mean, I assume that's what he's yelling, right? In context today, history has absolutely repeated itself. But in Habakkuk, he has this burden. He's a watchman on the wall. He's a prophet. He has an anointing to speak, thus saith the Lord. And notice what happens in chapter 2. And really, I'm just going to dive in for a moment and only go through the first three verses. And I will not even give you the entirety of everything that I want to say tonight. But... The Lord will give us exactly what we need for these moments we have. Habakkuk 2 and verse 1. I will stand upon my watch. This is after he's already pronounced judgment to the nation. Judgment to those in governmental authority. He says in verse 1, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower. And might I say, you and I may not be Habakkuk, but at the end of the day, we are watchmen on the wall. Ezekiel chapter 3 and Ezekiel 33. We are to warn the wicked of what is to come. Okay, so it, this is really interesting, actually, in my opinion. Um, he talked about this exact thing in his book. Um, th there were probably three chapters dedicated to this. Now, if you didn't read the book, I actually did a full breakdown of, of every single chapter. You can read every chapter with me on my Telltale Reads YouTube channel. Um, it, it's really interesting to, like... I don't know, hear the propagandizing happen like right in front of us and watch him form out these ridiculous ideas, which just so happen to be like the basis of his whole like theology and, and preaching technique. So anyway, let's keep listening to what he says here. If we warn them and they don't listen, it's on them. But if we don't warn them and they die in their iniquity, the Bible says three times their blood will be upon our hands. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And I think one of the reasons, don't have time to drill down into this theologically, but I think one of the reasons in Revelation chapter 21, the Bible says, and God shall wipe all tears from their eyes. Do you notice the historical context with which God wipes away our tears? It happens right after what event? The event that we call the great white throne judgment. Okay, Jehovah's Witnesses use this verse a lot too he will wipe every tear from their eyes um oh my god i got quoted this constantly anytime something bad would happen in my life when i was younger my mom would quote this stupid verse she would say neither will mourning nor outcry nor pain be anymore the former things have passed away that's basically what the verse says anytime there was like you know a, a bully or a, literally anything she would bring this shit up when whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The very next context is God shall wipe all tears from our eyes. The question must arise in our hearts. Why after people are thrown into hell does God wipe away all tears from our eyes? Because I believe we will be somewhere in the grandstands of the outer spaces and we will see every person that we could have warned, that we could have fasted for, that we could have told, that we could have brought to church, that we could have witnessed to, and they will turn to us and say, you knew the truth and never told me, you hypocrite. Uh, that's supposed to be comforting? I thought he was wiping tears from our eyes, not putting tears in our eyes. What? And they'll be cast forever into hell. You see, I don't think it's going to be like that. I think it's going to exactly be like that. Because This guy is, like, borderline... I don't know. There's just something deeply wrong about the way he views the world. Like, really disturbing stuff, man. I am missing, I'm trying to get to the Mickey Mouse room, that's what it's called, and I cannot figure out how to get there. It's like, it's above me, so I think if I go to the end and then take a left, maybe that'll get me there. Heaven would never be heaven if we remembered all the missed opportunities of the people that we let go to hell. And God wipes our tears, they must be there, and God wipes our memory and our mental capacity for such pain and we get to live forever in the glory of heaven for all of eternity but just remember this as well see that's the thing would i be me if i didn't have my memories right i i don't know that doesn't make any sense to me it's like they use oh this is where i missed it's like they use the idea of free will to excuse all of their 
nonsense like oh god can't fix anything for us because you have to have free will you have to be able to access free will if you don't have free will or if god like forced you to do this thing or that thing or whatever else then it wouldn't be fair like you have to like love and believe in god for the sake of loving and believing in god and that's it uh, even if there is no like evidence of his existence, that's the idea behind what people like Greg Locke say, right? So God cannot reveal himself because if he did, then it wouldn't be free will. Complete nonsense. But then in this type of situation, he says he's going to completely remove free will from the equation. He's going to remove any pain or sorrow or anything at, at all. Um. And you're going to, like, serve him for all eternity. It's just contradictory nonsense. All of it. As long as you're in heaven rejoicing, they'll be in hell remorsing. Same amount of time. Same amount of context. Same amount of eternity. We are watchmen on the wall. And I... Honestly, I find it deeply disgusting how these people view hell as, like... An eternal, like, okay, you want to put Hitler in hell? Fine. Hitler was terrible. Great. I'm okay with Hitler going to hell, right? But anybody, like, not as bad as Hitler does not deserve to go to hell, doesn't deserve to be tortured for eternity. And they seem to have this obsession with, like, anybody that they don't like going to hell. And they seem to, like, revel in it. Like, what the hell? It's deeply depraved stuff, man, really. Who would root for this, right? Say, watchmen, watch ladies, you better start watching. And the reason we watch is not just to sit soaking sour. We watch so we can warn, so we can know what's coming. And I'm telling you, there's crazy stuff coming. Even okay, well, when it comes, great. Right, I'm sorry, Greg Locke actually believes that there's crazy stuff happening, like, right now. He believes in QAnon. Like, he's a full-blown QAnoner. So, I, I really don't know what to, like, say from here, you know? He says crazy stuff's coming. In his mind, it's come. It's here. Even as prophetic as today is. For the first time in the history of our nation since 9-11, flights have been grounded. I'm telling you. Oh, my God. This is because of, an, I think, an FAA or some FAA, like, uh, glitch in their system. That's it. They were all grounded because this glitch, you know, probably didn't wouldn't create any issues, but might. So they just grounded everything just in case to make sure that nobody got hurt or whatever. That's all. That's what it was. And he's got to come up with some bizarre conspiracy theory about it, right? That's not accidental. God is shaking this nation. And if a watchman sees it and sits on their hands and does nothing with it, that will not be on the culture. That will be on the lazy watchman. Dude, what? He didn't even tell us what this supposed, like, grounded flights meant. He just said it's not accidental. What's he talking about? So Habakkuk said, I'm in the watchtower. I'm watching. And I will wait to see what he will say unto me. And what I shall say, answer when I am reproved. When God tells me, if he rebukes me, great. If he encourages me, great. I'm going to wait on the voice of God to speak. And when God speaks, I'm going to obey whatever it is that he says. And by the way, let me just please say this. I wouldn't intend on going any of these directions, but I think it's important that you understand this. The reason for some of you... God oh God, it's going to be crazy, isn't it? He's about to say something absolutely crazy. God no longer speaks is because you no longer listen. I hear that all Why is this guy yelling go, go, go nonstop? All time. Well, you know, God used to talk to me. That's because you used to obey him when he did, but now you don't obey him. And he's not going to talk to you because he already knows what your answer is going to be. Am I making sense? Somebody help. No, no, he's not. Help me tonight. And so he said, whatever God tells me, right, wrong, or indifferent, I'm going to obey it. Now watch this, verse 2. And the Lord answered me. God will answer you. 
Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me and I will answer thee. That's affirmative. And show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Why don't we see great and mighty things ye have not because ye ask not? Why is it that we don't pray and then when we don't get the answers because we didn't pray, God gets the bum rap for something we didn't get. We didn't even pray for it. What? I thought God knew what you needed before you even ask for it. You have to specifically and explicitly ask for things now is what you're telling me. I think one of the things we're going to find out, and I've never been there, so don't quote me on this, but my opinion theologically is when we get to heaven, one of the things that's going to bother us at the judgment seat of Christ, because we're not going to stand in judgment for our sin. The great white throne and the judgment seat are for two different people at two different times. We're going to stand for the motivation of our heart. Did we or did we not serve Jesus? And I think one of the things that's going to bother us the most at the judgment seat is how many blessings and gifts God had for us that we never asked for. No, God, okay, if we made it to, just hypothetically within this theology, if we made it to the throne of God or whatever, nothing's going to bother us. We made it, it seems to me. He's going to alter our brains to be happy, isn't he? What happened to all that? Maybe there's like a whole factory. I don't know what it's going to look like. I'm not going to write a book about it. I've never been there. I'm not, I'm not into all that heavenly tourism. But what I do know is this, when we get there, maybe there's a huge factory like the Amazon building that we walk in and here's all this stuff hanging everywhere, jammed up all over the place. I mean, it's just coming out of every shelf you can imagine. And when we say, Lord, what's all this? He'll say something like, it's all the stuff I would have given you if you'd have asked me and believed me for it. Yeah, because the one thing God wants to do once you get to heaven is to make you depressed. That was like his stated goal, wasn't it? Make you depressed. I seem to remember something about that in the Bible. God wants to make you really, really sad when you finally make it to heaven, right? Right? He said, I I'm going to obey what you say. Because look, if you listen, God will speak. He will speak. Fooey on this cessationist nonsense. Well, God don't speak to his people anymore. That's because you're not listening. God speaks just clearly. God speaks just fine. And the Lord answered me and said, write the vision. Now, wait a minute. I know the context of the book is the vision of judgment. But he said, look, you got to spell this thing out plainly so the people will understand. Write it down. Write the vision that I give you. Make it plain upon tables. Now, let me stop and say this. There's so many thousands of directions I can go. But I'm Dude, this is such a weird sermon he's giving right now. I am so confused by all this. Okay. Tell you something about writing the vision. Some of you are not used to dreaming certain things. And for some reason, when things started amping up at our church from 30 to 60, some of you are starting to have unusual dreams. What you ought to do is wake up and write it down. Wake up and write down that dream. So that 30 to 60 thing, if you didn't see the previous thing I did on Greg Locke or whatever, uh, he claimed that there are like four different types of people. And these four different types of people, quote unquote, represent the, the different levels of how much you can love Jesus, basically, for the most part. And uh, he's saying the, that his church amped up from 40 to 60 or from 30 to 60 or something. And uh, in that process, that church is way more spiritual and blah, 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 blah. So he's saying, by saying that, what he's really saying is the churchgoers have become a lot more spiritual, a lot more Christian, and have gained more insight into the Bible or whatever as prophets of God. I don't know. It's all weird. So that's what he's saying. Now, I'm not saying I can interpret it. I'm not a Joseph with a coat of many colors. But at the end of the day, you ought to write things down when God speaks to you. Now, I'm going to tell you something about this church. Now, I, I didn't always know it was going to be a great, big, huge, white tent. I, I didn't know that God was going to grow us the way that he did. I knew nothing about deliverance ministry. But everything we see God doing right now had been written down 17 years ago at 3 o'clock in the morning on a Waffle House napkin. Because I knew God was going to do it. I just didn't know how he's going to do it. I just couldn't figure out how I was going to pull it off. Dude, what did this guy yell just now? Let's just step back and listen because it wasn't go, go, go this time. Let's see what he said. Because I knew God was going to do it. I just didn't know how he's going to do it. Did he say go, go napkin? 
I don't know what he's trying to get at when he says all this stuff. I just couldn't figure out how I was going to pull it off in the denominational hierarchy that I was in, right? But I wrote it down. Because he was Baptist at the time, and he's no longer Baptist. God said, write it down. Man, I'm writing stuff on the, on the Waffle House napkin. Now, look, I brought something up here tonight. I have went from Waffle House napkins to this now, praise God. <laughs> I keep that in my office, and I tore some stuff off so y'all... Oh, no, he's got a uh, prop. ...wouldn't see it, because I can't tell about my secrets, amen. Not everybody can handle what God's doing in you at one time. Be careful who you share your vision with, because not everybody's been stretched enough to handle it. Can I get a witness right there? Help me, Holy Ghost. And so, I, I get this in my office. You can tear this thing off and just stick it right on the wall, praise God. Them, them dummy stickers, right? When God speaks to me in that office, I write stuff down. I draw cage tents before they show up. I write stuff. I write stuff on there about missionaries. I write stuff. Oh, God give me a sermon. I'll get out there and start jotting it down. Write it down. Make it plain. Write it out. Start writing out what God says. For some of you, God is going to begin to download into you unbelievable realities if He can trust you to write it down so you can save it for a later day. Because everything God tells you isn't for the moment. But when God tells you something, you better jot it down. Just leave him post-it notes right there, praise God. You can get that at Staples for about nineteen ninety nine. praise God. He keeps saying praise God over and over and over again. Why? Your guess is as good as mine. Beep. That was easy. About five of you got that. Thank you, baby. I just... This is just so weird and confusing, everything about it. Made Staples some money, Amen. <laughs> And the Lord answered me and said, write the vision. Write the vision. Let me tell you something about vision. It doesn't take life until you write it down. Oh, oh, wait. Was that beep thing that he did, was that him hitting the it's that easy button? Is there a it's that easy button for Staples? I don't remember if that's like a Staples thing or what. I feel like it is. It's just a pipe dream in your head. It's just something you're thinking about. It's just something that gives you heartburn and headache. No, write it down. Start scheduling. Start asking God to give you dreams and, and plans and schematics for that ministry, for your marriage, for that. He's trying to get people to admit that they're prophets. He wants to produce prophets from his church. He thinks that's like the next step before the end comes or something. It's prophets all over the place, I think class for the business that God told you to start for that book you're supposed to write for that music you're supposed to write for that song you're supposed to write for, for that house that you're supposed to build start writing stuff down everybody's got plans right but when they bring this thing down and put the other one up they got plans that they follow get you some plans write them down now I know maybe we ought to put that in the man plan next month read directions before you build something Oh my God, the man plan. Okay, I talked about this in a video not too long ago, but he's trying to capture Andrew Tate's audience by doing a the man plan. That's what he calls it. It is a the man plan. And it's uh, basically just this document that he handed out. It's like a, I don't know, a three-page booklet or a, I don't know, maybe a 10-page booklet of like something that you're supposed to do every single day. You're supposed to do this every day to make sure that you're a real man. Some of the items on the list were things like wash your wife's feet, go on a date with her every week. I mean, you know, decent things. Those are okay, except the washing your feet part. That's kind of fucking weird. But some of the things that he suggested were actually on point. Others were just really, really weird. That's the man plan. That is his attempt to capture Andrew Tate's audience. <laughs> Now, I get around that because I just don't build nothing. <laughs> Amen. I'm like, hey, man, I'll give you 50 bucks. Can you build this? I can't do it. Right? I just, I don't like to build stuff. But when I do, I got to read it. And how many of us? Yeah, that's the man plan. Don't even read it. That's, that's our plan. Well, I don't need that. Just throw that in the, in the garbage can. I can. I can build this correct. Well, that power wheel is supposed to have four wheels, not six. That's a windshield, not a bumper. <laughs> And so we don't read the directions, and then we expect it to come together well. And God says, look, I want you to write it down because I've given you some instruction. I've given you some directions. It's interesting to me that we have a whole book where God wrote his vision. It's called the Bible. 
It's not just floating in the outer spaces. He wrote it down. Vision, dreams, anointing, goals, whatever you want to call them, because I'm not a motivational pop psychology guru. Right? I'm a gospel preacher. But when God gives you something, it doesn't take life until you start writing it down. It just doesn't. I can't tell you how many years I prayed that God would let me write a book. I didn't even care if anybody bought it. Okay, sounds like he just likes writing. I personally don't actually like writing. I, I feel like writing is just miserable sometimes. It's, it's really hard to be creative from time to time, you know? I would rather do, like, repetitive tasks really, really well. I, I would rather perfect repetitive tasks, like editing, or add, like, a creative flair into re repetitive tasks. Like, I don't like writing scripts i like improvising on air talking to you guys and stuff and i like perfecting scripts that's my whole thing or, i'm sorry perfecting editing techniques that's my whole thing but i guess greg Locke deeply likes writing okay fantastic um that doesn't mean that god like put the love of writing in your heart or whatever other nonsense that's not what happened you just like writing just accept that you like writing there's nothing wrong with that i just wanted to hold a book in my hand that was professionally printed okay you can hold any number of books in your hand that are professionally printed i don't understand it had my name on it for the bible oh, see that's where that's different that's different that's not the same bible verse on the back i was like i, I just I, one day i'm gonna write a book and all these as our Ministry began to grow and the notoriety, if you will, even politically began to grow through the years, 2015, 16, 17. I was like, okay, it's going to be. And I'd have all the, you know, charisma, various people call, oh, yeah, we're going to do this, you know, Destiny How We're going to do this. We're going we're to do it. And, and it would never come through. And I'm like, my goodness, why, why, Lord, I've got a book in me. I know I do. And I'd go out there to that tree and I'd just talk to the Lord about it. And I remember I was out there one night and God said, I want you to start speaking into your phone in the middle of the night I want it recorded now when I say speaking I don't mean verbal recording record it so that it types it out it dictates what you're saying and sometimes it's stupid but nonetheless you know what you're saying and I'd get out there and I just okay I just I feel like this is like a totally pointless like route to go down but all right just walk back and forth and I'd start talking into it three o'clock in the morning I'd, I'd send it to Wayne fix this Wayne this is what I'm gonna say it's he'll be there right now. Fix it up. Make it sound good. But I oh, is Wayne who completely butchered the editing on that book? Okay. Yeah, like I said, I read this book in uh, like on my Telltale Reads YouTube channel. And there, you know, I can't talk too much shit about it after reading Donald Trump, the Messiah, the Christ. That was a piss poor book. But... You know, Greg Locks was nothing to write home about either. His book was pretty bad, honestly. It was bad. Um, there was a, there were a lot of editing mistakes and poor grammar and bizarre, confusing ideas presented in a weird way, a nonsensical way. It was just not good. I'm sorry. Uh, his book wasn't good. Well, like I said, overall, compared to Donald Trump, the Messiah, the Christ, uh, it was better than that at the very least. I'll give him that. By the by, I have um, two regular missile packs left, one super missile, one power bomb left. I don't know where those things are. I'm just kind of perusing because I almost 100% of the game. I don't remember which ones I've missed so far. I didn't even realize I missed any in the wrecked ship, but... Lo and behold, I did find one here. So anyway, let's keep listening. A matter of months, we had a best-selling book. This means war, right? Was it best-selling? That's the one that we read on um, Telltale Reads. I'm not sure if that was a best-selling book, but okay. Not because I'm some fantabulous author. No, sometimes you just surround yourself with people that can do things a lot more fantabulous than you can, and it makes you look good at the end of the day, right? But it's one. No, it's because he talked about Black Lives Matter and Antifa nonstop in the book. And, you know, Trumpist nutcases love listening to people talk about that stuff. 
you talk about how evil those you know groups are and you got it made you've got a best-selling book in that just from the trumpists alone when i began to put it down when i began to write it the vision began to come to the page and the book began to help people okay it hasn't helped anybody it's ruined people's lives but yeah, it hasn't helped anyone. In that book, he, he actually lays out a prophecy that he had, a supposed prophecy. Um, but reiterates multiple times in the book that he's not a prophet, quote unquote. I am not a prophet, he says. Despite the fact that he prophesied in multiple spots. I just don't get why he's denying it, but whatever. And then weapons of our warfare. And then our very public goodbye to cessationism, accessing your anointing. And then Wait, did he write other books? I is he listing the other books that he's that he's written? That's interesting. In revival, and now coinciding with the movie, our fifth book, come out in Jesus' name, because we're gonna have to write a book about deliverance, Amen. Because we still believe there's power in the name of Jesus. Oh God, should we read those books too? But it all started when God said, "You better start jotting stuff down." See, I'm good mentally with my mind i can memorize a lot of things god's gifted me with a photographic memory in a lot of ways but there's some things god says it'll never take life until you get a piece of paper a napkin a post-it note a pencil and you start writing that's why journaling is important if you want to write a book yeah i suppose so you know what a lot of you don't know i don't even know why i'm getting emotional i'm thinking about this Everybody knows my wife's prayers, right? She didn't always pray like that. Oh, yeah, what he's talking about, his wife comes up and, and like, prays a lot. And uh, the prayers that she gives are long-winded. And uh, how does the Bible put it in Matthew? She uses many words like the pagans, something like that. Um the way that she prays is very obviously openly condemned by the book of Matthew. But anyways, yeah, that's what he's talking about. I, I couldn't get her to pray over mashed potatoes at Cracker Barrel. Right? She wasn't going to. That wasn't her. But what a lot of people don't know about my wife's prayer is they did not start on a platform in front of a lot of people with a microphone in her hand. She started journaling her prayers for years write the vision because it's when you put stuff on paper that God animates it and it comes to life am I making sense tonight I'm just being no I think that's just taking the first step to write a book or to accomplish a goal that's what he's talking about taking that first step that's what matters has nothing to do with God he's implying that success is only achievable if God allows it. And that's just nonsense. That's just not true. Look at me. I'm successful to some degree. Some people would call me successful, right? And I'm an atheist. I don't believe any of this garbage. How can he make it out as though God is the only one that can like provide success to people? When there are a ton of atheists out there. Hell, when there are a ton of, like, Muslims out there that are successful in, in life. Like, none of this makes any sense at all. None of this checks out. Complete garbage. Simple with you. Some of you got dreams and goals? Write them down. Get your checklist. Get your checklist. That, that, that's why we have a checklist for the man plan. It's easier to do 30 push-ups a day when you got to check it off. When you got it right in front of your face. It's easy to forget for a couple of weeks and then all of a sudden I'm like, oh my goodness, I gotta do 350 push-ups, catch up. Well, you're done. Okay, you're done now, right? You gotta write it down. Make it plain. Write it down. Make it plain. Write it down. Make it plain. And so God said, Look, I want your vision to take life. So what do you do? Write it down. Write the vision. Make it plain upon the tables. That means write it big. And be specific. You see, here's a good little outline. If you're trying to figure out what God wants you to do next, write some stuff down and here's what you do. Be bold, be brief, be biblical. You'll notice his vision was not in contradiction to the voice of God. It was in unison with the voice of God. So don't tell me God's called you to do something that contradicts the voice. 
Your vision will never contradict what's already written. Well, God's called me to do this, and I know it's, it's sinful. No, 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 God didn't call you to do no such thing. This is really interesting, actually, um, particularly for people who read the book with me. Um, he's very obviously kind of adding on to what he had to say in the book right now. God is never going to call you to do something that's against what he already wrote. His vision is already the primary example and blueprints for what he's calling us to do. He says, write it down, write it big, make it plain, be specific. I think the reason we don't have specific answers to prayer is because we're still praying too generically. We pray things like this, Lord, you know I've got a lot of bills. Please meet my needs. No, no, no. Pray for the amount of your rent. Pray for the amount of your credit card bill. Pray for the amount of your water bill. Pray down to the very penny, and God will meet it every time. That's simply not true. That has not happened. People have been broke as shit and needed their energy bills paid or whatever, and they did not get paid. So I just, I disagree. What now? Okay, we have 220 missile packs, 45 super missiles, and 45 power bombs. We're supposed to have 230 missiles, 50 super missiles, 50 power bombs. So we are four, um, what do you call it? Like four uh, packs behind. I don't know where the others are. Well, we have all E-tanks. We have all um, reserve tanks and everything, but yeah, uh, I guess we can continue on to defeat Mother Brain now. I just wish I knew where the others went. All right, let's keep listening. You say, well, I just don't know if I believe that. It's because you've never tried it. Be bold. I told our staff a while back, I don't have a whole lot of staff meetings. Our staff knows that. I'm not a micromanager. I figure if I hire you to do a job and you're doing a good job, I ain't got a lord over you. When you need to be told something, you get told something. And so our staff knows that I trust them to accomplish what I have asked them and prayed and prepared and paid them to accomplish. And so they do it. So when we have a staff meeting, I mean, we get in there and we have real staff meetings, right? We don't have fall down the steps, cussing, fussing, yelling, screaming, this, that, and the other. But I, I, I tell our staff often that I, I, I'm really, I, I'm at a place right now well, I don't even know what God wants to do next. It's just so amazing. I, I just like wake up every day and I'm like, what are you going to do today, Lord? <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's amazing to me. But I tell them, look, the answer to what you are asking is yes. Are you sure you want to give a blanket yes to somebody? Okay. These are the yes days. You can't pray big enough. You can't ask big enough. You can't expect big enough. Because I'm going to tell you something. If you'd have told me, first of all, that we would have four or five best-selling books, I'd have told you it's crazy. Yeah, I don't know that it, they're best-sellers. All four or five of his books are best-sellers. I'm super skeptical, but okay. But God said, if you'll do what I tell you to do, I'm going to show you just how crazy things can get. And when we got bold, guess what happened? We went from best-selling books to 2,000 movie theaters all over America supported by secular people. What's he talking about? I, I'm lost. I have no clue what he's going on about. I know that I'm pretty sure he released a movie. I don't remember what the movie was or what it was about or whatever other thing, but... I, I'm super skeptical that like the movie did well or whatever, or that he has that it was supported by secular people. What? See what I'm saying? Okay, we went from Lifeway, which they probably wouldn't carry my books, but we went from Lifeway to screens. How's that happen? Because you get specific. You stop asking God for little patty cake praise stuff. Oh, just give me j just enough. Oh, no, no, God's a God of abundance. He can do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ever ask or think according to the power that works in us. You think about some of the biggest prayers that God's answered for you as of late. I promise you he did it in abundance. He didn't do it just barely to get by. Things you've been praying about, so what you do? You got a plan. You started putting that plan together, and when you put the moment you put that pen on the paper, God started moving. And here you are. Survived a whole nother year. 
You sure didn't think you'd make it this long, but you did. And you know what you got in your heart? Dreams, unfulfilled goals, visions, God's called you to, ministries, businesses, relationships, things that you know God wants you to do. So here's what you do. Before you go to bed tonight, you go home and you rock. You look, he's making it out as though God resolves everything for people in abundance, quote unquote. That's just nonsense. That's just not true. People suffer terribly, whether he likes to admit that or not. And, and, we're talking people that, like, really love Jesus, too. They suffer terribly. Look, that ripper died. What's sucking? Look, there's another enemy that, that just fades to dust. What is sucking the life out of these guys? Oh, look, there's a hopper. He's invincible. I can't hit it. Oh, my God. Holy Christ on a cracker. What was that? I am disturbed. Wow, that thing just sucked the life right out. God, if you do it just right, you can escape it. This is called the baby. I, I did it wrong. <laughs> That's okay. It is going to suck the life right out of me, except leave me with one HP. Scary stuff, man. Scary stuff, and now the baby is going to go away and leave me be. Let me die because I have one life left. Little does the baby know there's a regeneration room right here. So I'll be okay after all. Missile and health. This would be like the ultimate scam for the baby Metroid. Uh, suck all the life out of me wait for me to go regenerate and then do it again suck all the life out of me all over again just keep going in circles like that that'd be perfect for the baby right actually gonna recharge my missiles i'm low on super missiles this only recharges regular missiles but that's okay okay we're about to face mother brain the final boss of super metroid hey owen I don't know if someone else has brought this up to you, but apparently the guy that keeps shouting go, go, go has a YouTube channel and he's called the go, go, go guy. He's posted videos with Greg and I guess he's just a hype man. Really? I did not know that. Thank you so much for letting me know. Hang on. Let's see if I can find this. Oh my God. He does have a YouTube channel. This is the go, go, go guy apparently. Hey everybody, it's James Breedwell, the Go 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 Guy, and I want to thank you for stopping in and checking out my channel. Hey, listen, what a great day today. Man, Pastor Greg Locke, oh man, he preached a great sermon today. It was awesome. Um, and, uh, you know, if you haven't gone to 2060, come to our church yet, 2060 Old Lebanon Dirt Road, you need to. Please do yourself a favor. God is working in the church like you wouldn't believe. There are people getting delivered left and right. So 1030 on Sundays, uh, 7 on Wednesdays, and then Sunday night we're back at 6 um, uh, for deliverance. It, it's just amazing. I'll tell you what. Dude, does what does he do for work, you think? He's got 1.2 thousand subscribers. So 1,200 subscribers is what this guy's got. Wow, man. I had no idea that this there was a go, go, go guy. This is news to me. So here, here's another. Good morning, my fellow brothers in Christ and the church body. Reaching out to you this bright and early morning as the sun comes up over my shoulders and we can see what the Lord hath made. Folks, listen, I'm asking you today for some special prayer requests. Uh, one being Miss Debbie Watkins and her husband, Danny Watkins. Danny has been in the hospital now since November with some health issues that are quite challenging you know what it, i think if i were greg Locke, it would probably annoy me that somebody was building a platform off of yelling something very specific during my church services that would probably get on my nerves but i don't know that's really interesting thank you so much for telling me about that knowing is half the battle or in this case going is half the battle unless go 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 guy is really a plant of greg Locke, and he's just another funnel yeah, I don't think so. It doesn't seem like it, but maybe. I suppose that's po anything's possible. All right, let's keep listening to uh, Locke here. Be brief about it. Be biblical about it. Be bold about it. Ask God for everything you possibly can. Because I'm telling you, he's a God of bigness. He's a God of abundance. Now, I'm not just talking about 
financial remuneration, prosperity gospel nonsense. Oh, no, I'm talking about them relationships that are fragmented that you want God to put back together. He can do it. The Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, neither is his ear heavy that he cannot hear. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. You think of the person this year that you want to get born again, and maybe you put their name on this platform already. God's going to save them this year. God's going to redeem them this year. God's going to see them baptized, going to see them healed, going to see them set free, going to see them delivered. That marriage is going to get put back together. That prodigal son, that prodigal daughter, that grand youngin's coming back home. I'm telling you, it's happening right before our very eyes. you got to write it out. You see, we can come up. There's the go, go, go guy again in the background. You can hear it. It's like every three seconds, practically, the guy says, go, go, go. Kind of annoying, right? Seems kind of annoying to me anyways. I don't know. Oop. Here, we can pray out loud, Lord, bring so-and-so home. But when you wrote their name on those steps and we covered them with carpet, that changed the game right there. That got God's attention. Am I making sense? Make it plain. Write it big on them. Go home and just write all over the wall. I don't care where you write. Just start writing it out. This is what God wants to do in my marriage in 2023. Write it out. This is what I want my business to be. Write it out. Get you a kingdom-sized business plan. Write it down and say, God, if you don't do it, it ain't going to get done. And by the way, if your vision don't scare you, God didn't give it to you. If you got enough money in the bank right now to fulfill your vision, it ain't God's vision. You will never have enough resources on hand to figure out where God's taking you. Right? But it's crazy to me that all these years later, I can get up on a Wednesday night of all things and say, Hey, uh, we need $575,000 cash. Right, that's in reference to the fact that he wants to build, like, an, a new uh, church, like a, a soundproof church or whatever. That is so much money. And, yeah, he's saying that he intends to, like, fundraise that. Like, holy shit, dude, that is so much money. And, by the way, we're going to buy 2,500 chairs that are 40 bucks a piece. Do the math with that, $115,000. Let's just raise $700,000. And I'm just up here like, woo, can't wait till Sunday. <laughs> if I was trying to raise $7,000, we got that in the bank at the church. That wouldn't be a deal. But you try to raise that kind of money, it's got to be God-sized. So what you want to do is you want to write down stuff that naturally you can't pull off. But supernaturally, God can pull it off. Because if you could pull it off, you'd get all the credit for it. But when you jump out of the boat expecting to sink and God lets you walk on water, let me tell you something. You'll know then that it's God that gets all the glory for what he's doing in your life. <laughs> Woo! I wasn't even going to preach tonight. And this text got me tore up from the floor up. Tore up from the floor up. Okay. There's a whole book in this. Amen. Make it plain. Tell God what you want. Now watch this. That, here's why you write it down. Here's why you make it plain. That he may run that readeth it. Now, that doesn't mean that you make it so big that when they run by it, they see it like a billboard. What it means is there's such urgency in your message that you run with it. You see, people say this all the time to me and to other people. Wow, you just, you look so tired. You need to get a nap. And by the way, sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is take a nap. Amen? I don't understand. I guess so. <laughs> But I'm going to tell you something that you need to understand about successful people. Not that I am one, but I, I, I try to be successful for Jesus. The world is run by tired people. Hear me? The world is run by tired people. Great churches are not built with spare time and pocket change. We're going to get tired. We get tired personally. I get tired in the work, but I never get tired of the work. And don't get it twisted. There's two very different realities. Dude, again, I, I feel, am I missing something? Maybe I'm just not like focused in on what he's saying, but this just sounds like total nonsense to me. This is like when I was sitting at the meetings as a Jehovah's Witness, listening to them just ramble on about nonsense. 
Sometimes we just got to relax, but I'm telling you, the Bible says when you get something, it's boiling on the inside, you just got to run with it. You just got to go with it. You know, our friend uh, Malachi O'Brien preached on fasting at the conference. We got him coming back here pretty soon. I love Malachi. How many have you been following his journey? He's on number 98 today. 98 consecutive without breaks, full marathons every day. Okay. Can you do a marathon in a single day like that? 98 marathons per day? How long is a marathon? What does that even mean exactly? I'm so lost. He broke the Guinness World Record at 62. Is that even true? Is any of this true? Ooh, I'm about to uh, fight Mother Brain again. He runs 26.2 miles every day. Rain, sleet, hot, cold. 26.2 miles every single day. He's done it for 98 straight days. No ex and still pastors a church and still travels. Sometimes he'll wait till the clock strikes 12 and he'll, he'll go out at midnight because it's the next day and start running till like four in the morning. And he okay, we're going to have to take a, a vote. Are we going to save the animals or kill the animals? Let's, let's take a vote, find out. Because we're about to get to that point. Save or kill the animals on Super Metroid. I always, always, always save the animals. So we'll see. We'll find out. We're going to play Greg Locke again in a second. But first, let's find out if we save or kill. We'll keep this up on screen. It's looking like save so far. Just the frame rate on this is insane. Because it's so, like so laggy from all the stuff happening on screen you know oh my god that super jump sucks dude space jump i'm sorry the space jump is terrible it keeps failing on me what is it that causes the space jump to fail like that i don't know it's the worst though And the frame rate on this puppy is something else. There we go. I was not doing a wall climb with acid coming up on me like that. Looking like save. Wow, it's not even close. With my audience, apparently everybody wants to save. <laughs> Okay, save it is. I was going to save anyways. <laughs> nah, I was going to respect the poll. You just go in this little room here and save them. You go in here. Uh, I should have gone straight for the ship, but here are the animals. You got to bust open this opening here. And they run out. And then you go all the way back to the ship. And it, it wastes like, I don't know, 30 seconds or so. Probably not even. Chat is full of furries. Obviously, it'll be safe. <laughs> Fair enough. There it is. And we beat Super Metroid. And here's how you know if you saved or killed. A single speck. Watch. Watch the plane. It'll come out from the right side. A single speck on the right. One pixel. Watch closely. As my ship comes away. Give it a second. There's my ship. There it is. See it? See the little speck going by? That was the animals. That speck does not appear if you don't save the animals. I think I got 98% item clearance or something like that, like item collection. I think it said four hours, right? A lot of that was spent running around looking for those extra items that I couldn't find. 420, was it really 420? No way. Oh, that's awesome. No way. That's the shit. 
Very nice. It's a good game. Really good game. I didn't play this until I... Well, I didn't beat it until I was older. I was like... Um, I was 28. I was about 28 when I beat it for the first time. It came out when I was like two, maybe? It's a very old game. Oh, shit. I almost knocked my coffee over. Oh, here's the thing again. Deer Force! Produced by Deer Force. Thank you, Deer Force. You get different images of Samus based on your item collection rate and your time and stuff. I think she gets progressively less dressed. If I remember correctly. That's the screw attack thing. Your rate for collection is 96%. That's pretty good. I only missed four items, I think. All right, sweet. We beat Super Metroid. Awesome. Great game. Great game.